Felix, okay. over to you. All right. So, uh, so thanks for those of you who are still here. Um, the idea is to, to talk a little bit about uh, how companies can benefit from integrating open source into their corporate strategy. This presentation I normally use uh, to talk to uh, entrepreneurs, startups, uh, sometimes VCs. Uh, so it's content that's, uh, that's uh, really designed for this kind of audience. And the idea is that a lot of people uh, in the enterprise world see open source as just a cool way to save money on licenses. So my task with these people is to make sure that they find a way to use open source in a way that does much more than just save a few bucks on licenses. And so with these, uh, these elements that I'm going to cover in the next 25 minutes, that's exactly what I try to achieve. So first of all, um, I'm, I'm going to move really quickly through here because I suppose that after those four days, everybody here knows what is open source. Um, but it, it is just a reminder that not only do you have a permission to do things, um, but you also have obligations as a developer using open source to do things, right? People think open source is freedom. It's also obligations. Obligation to reshare code you've modified or things you've added to a project. So, uh, so that's, that's the, the reminder um, I have. And um, normally I explain all of this. I just want to have a quiz here to see who's awake. Anybody can guess what that code is from on the left? I'm not going to ask for the right part, but for the left part. No guess? So it's open source, of, co of course, which is why I'm picking it up. It's part of the RSA uh, 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 encryption routines of open SSL. So it's, uh, it's crypto code, which you can sort of guess from the entropy. It's part of a random number generator element. <laughs> All right. Um, I have those first two slides as a reminder for my enterprise customers, for example, that uh, open source is used in almost every company on the planet, large and small, um, and that companies uh, have been benefiting from open source. That's what I'm going to cover for the rest and the meeting part of this presentation. Enterprises have been benefiting from open source in, in many different ways. Um, sometimes uh, they do that purely by luck. They realize that, oh, we've been doing open source for this long, and this is what has happened, or this is what has come out of it. Um, other companies uh, make a point of, because they use open source, trying to benefit from as much of open source as they can. This is where people like myself, who do uh, open source strategy consulting for, for companies, come into play. So we're going to go through some of the benefits that, that open source brings to, to companies. I am sure you're aware of them. Uh, not necessarily all of them, not necessarily how to benefit from all of them or who does. So, so let's, um, let's look at, uh, at a few of them. The first one, I'm sure you've all heard that open source is cheap or even free. Um, and, and if you think that by using open source because it's free you're going to save money, it is often a mistake. Uh, typically what happens is that the cost of your licenses is compensated by cost of integration, training, support, and things like that. What is interesting with, um, uh, with open source, though, is that you are in control of your financial agenda. This means that you decide where you're going to put your money. And you decide you don't want to put it in licenses, which is fairly good, but there are other places where there's high value uh, that you can gain from investing in open source. As an example, um, there was a, uh, the, the, the South African um, region called KwaZulu-Natal, the government came to me when I was at Sun Microsystems and they wanted to, uh, to use something else than Microsoft Office because Microsoft, well, you know, paying a bunch of millions of dollars of money to a country far, far away and having zero local benefits except the authorization to run a piece of code um, didn't make sense to them. So they wanted to use something that was, that was free to use. Uh, so they were purely looking at the cost aspect, but they didn't have a support structure for open office. So at the time, Sun Microsystems, who, was, who were the, uh, the maintainers of the project open office, uh, were asked, how can we do this? So I had a long session with them and I explained to them that, okay, fine, they don't want to put a lot of money into Microsoft, which, fair enough. Um, why not put some money into training people? And we, at the time, 
I was at Sun Microsystems, we will be very happy to take that money from you and to train people that in KwaZulu Natal will be experts on open office, will have access to the support structures that we have in place as the project maintainers. But these people, once they're trained, they will be able to train other people. They will be able to build businesses that will support the, uh, the government users and the, indi and the individual users in the country. So as a result, the money invested in running this open source piece of software is fully re-injected into the local economy. Um, my, my friends from the French Ministry, uh, I'm French, so my friends from the French Ministry of Interior, they actually have a very good way of saying that. Say, they say that the cost of using and developing open source software as a nation, so as part of the government, the cost is zero or positive, meaning that every dollar, euro, Singapore dollar, whatever, every bit of money that's injected as a government, not as an industry, but as a government, into developing open source is actually not money that is spent because you, you inject it by paying developers. <coughs> Those developers, if, and that's the key point, if they're in the country, they might be foreigners, but they live in the country, these developers will spend that money by renting houses, purchasing goods in stores, paying their tax, um, having children, going to school, creating new uh, breed of people who are uh, experts in something else. So that money invested in an open source development <coughs> gets re-injected into the economy. <coughs> and as such, the, the overall balance is actually zero because you inject it into whatever you're running already. And it's positive when as a turnout, there are new companies started, uh, created, startups, etc. So, depending on where you sit in, in the, the, using, the user uh, families of open source, uh, you can look at your, your, your uh, budget for using open source as something that's either totally controlled, where do I want to put it, where does it make sense, or um, even better, as a government, as something that injects money into the economy. So, that's, um, that's something that is, uh, that's quite interesting. Another aspect also is that um, if you're in the enterprise world, sometimes your finance people will want you to stop investing into, uh, into capital. So not, do not buy stuff. Rent it. Uh, so shift from uh, CapEx, capital expenditures, to OPEX. And that makes sense uh, for some companies. And using open source, in particular if your software comes with a subscription model, turns your CapEx, I'm buying licenses, into OPEX, I'm paying a subscription. And that can be interesting as also as a startup because as a startup when you're getting funding, your VC who's pouring millions of dollars in the company would like to know that those millions of dollars is going into something that actually makes sense and not something that after devaluation in three years will make zero sense. A software license for Microsoft Office 2010, five years from now, dead. So actually now, dead. So, because everybody wants to go to 2013, 2018, or whatever. So, so uh, shifting to OPEX actually makes sense for some cases. So keep in mind that crucial aspect. When people say open source is free, it is not. That's not what you're looking for. Open source is a great way to control your, uh, your spending. A great way. But it can turn out to be more expensive. Huh? If you look at all the integration costs, service costs, support costs, etc. If you, if you don't do it well, um, and here, shameless plug for my company, you know, if, if you don't know how to, how to do the integration of your, uh, your open source stuff, talk to system integrators like us. And this is the only time I'm going to talk about my company, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Um, good. The next, uh, the next one, uh, which is quite interesting, is innovation. Um, and I, I'm not going to read the numbers, I'm just using this as kind of a reminder of what I want to talk about, but one of the most commonly mentioned benefits of open source is the ease and the speed of innovation. When you're developing your software with people from the outside, <coughs> they bring you great ideas. Um, one of Sun Microsystems founders once said something really true. Innovation happens elsewhere. Right? Inside the box, you're not getting the new ideas. It's all framed by hundreds of years, depending on the kind of company you're in, tens of years, whatever. Uh, frame of mind. Uh, if you ask Boeing to imagine new things, they're going to imagine new planes. They're not going to imagine new ways of cooking stuff. And it's very rare that a company that's doing something very specific turns 90 degree 
and does something completely different. So innovation from the outside is great. And when you're doing open source, you're encouraging that. You're encouraging your users to go way beyond what your marketing team can do. Your marketing team is saying, we need to develop these features and these features and these features because we think they make sense and we will get more customers and, and it'll generate bloatware, which is where you go with uh, the guys from Redmond. If you're doing open source, what happens is your users look at your product and say, I really miss this feature. And I miss it enough that I'm actually going to write it myself and give it to the guys so that it's integrated as part of the project. Um, to give you an idea, um, I was talking to the Japanese, well, the Japanese government came and talked to me and said, we, that was years ago, we are now bringing in a new uh, extended kanji character set that's going to be used everywhere. And we need our office suite to actually implement that kanji, extended kanji character set. We've asked Microsoft, they're going to come with that or directly in their new version of, uh, of Office, and that's in two years or whatever, yeah, two, two and a half years at the time it was until the next release of, of Office was planned. Bad timing. Um, and they would, also, of course, have to upgrade their licenses and everything. So they came to Sun and said, guys, can you do it for us on Open Office? And I said, no, we can't do it for you, but you guys can do it. What I will do is I will help you find the right team to do that experts in programming, uh, graphics experts, uh, fonts experts, uh, and, and make sure that this team has direct links to the development team of OpenOffice so that if you run into trouble, you can actually have somebody to ask the questions to and not just throw them into the wild. And say they thought about it and they said, okay, let's try that. And instead of waiting two and a half years for Microsoft to do the next release of, of Office, they did it in two and a half months. So think about the difference in speed it cost them paying developers for two and a half months, so probably a, a fair amount of money, but probably a lot less than upgrading their licenses to MS Office for every user. And by doing this the way they did and contributing it, well, if you get OpenOffice, and now LibreOffice, actually, the supported for extended kan kanji character set is in there because it was contributed by them, accepted by the community, and it's now part of the software forever. So that's, that's one great way to look at, uh, at innovation and, and speed of innovation, speed to market, uh, is by getting people from the outside to, to help you with, uh, with developing your, uh, your software. Um, which is a fantastic link to hear. So, so keep in mind that instead of spending your resources as a developer um, on trying to imagine new ways of doing things, you're getting that support, that, uh, that manpower, from the outside. Instead of having to do the work yourself, you have to coordinate the work yourself. So you need to put in place the right way to, uh, to manage a team, uh, to manage an open source project, and that's, that's okay. That's not necessarily easy. Um, but um, if you look at, at, at companies um, out there, they're actually, uh, all of them are saying, well, all of them, a vast majority, are saying that it is helping them go faster. And that can be by saying, we're going to move our code to the open source and waiting for people to contribute or by saying we're opening a challenge. Uh, there's a company, uh, it was acquired by Wipro, but it's a company that's out there called uh, Top Coders, and these people can be used to fund open source uh, challenges, or fund any kind of challenges actually, uh, but guys like Apple are using them, so the way it works is you, you want to develop a functionality, a tool, a product, an extension, or whatever. You go to Top Coder and you say, I have this project, here are the specs, here's the, the scope, etc. I'm putting a bounty, and for whoever does the best development for it, they get the bounty, runner-ups get something less, and etc. So it's a great way to actually uh, incentivize your, uh, the, open so the open source community, there's no such thing, but the people out there who like to do open source, to actually contribute to your own project. And the nice way to do it is to do it open source, obviously, but you could do it uh, proprietary if you want. I don't encourage it because, well, I'm an open source guy. Um, Marketing tool, this is a really interesting one. People don't think about that often enough, but um, it's a great way to, to position yourself in the market. Uh, one example that I have, which is really fun, I, I used to think that Mercedes cars, and I know we have people from the company here in the room, but Mercedes cars tend to be grandfather cars. They have some really fancy roadsters, by the way. But my dad has had Mercedes for quite some time. And the last one he bought, he came to me and he showed me a CD and he said, 
gee, I have no idea what this is. And the CD is all of the open source licenses for all the open source software in the car. And suddenly I looked at the CD and I looked at this car completely differently, like, oh my God, this is a really cool car. <laughs> so it, it will appeal to a certain population. Um, in, the, in the more common world, what happens is, for example, <coughs> companies like Novartis, uh, they're in a world which is a really secretive world. It's pharmaceutical. Most people don't publish their findings, their formulas, even their algorithms. And internally, they use Windows, they use uh, Linux, and, and quite a few open source technologies. But what is really cool about Novartis is they have a lab that is publishing uh, um, oncology-specific uh, uh, algorithms that help in, in identify molecules uh, that are uh, present in the cancer type of treatments. And they're publishing all of this source code uh, on GitHub. So if you search for Novartis GitHub, you'll find they have a lab that's called ONPC or whatever. They have a lab which is publishing their source code on the internet. And they're doing this for speed of innovation because they're hoping people will participate, but they're positioning themselves as the thought leader in this aspect. They're saying, we're the guys who do it best. Have a look. So that's a really interesting aspect, uh, and it's clearly seen as part of their marketing budget to have this code posted to, uh, to GitHub. So keep that in mind. You might want to uh, consider, if you're a commercial vendor, um, uh, to take your, your products that can be open sourced and push them out to the community to get a completely different perception of who you are uh, and, um, and, and, and attract a whole range of uh, different users. Um, what example can I have along those lines that makes, uh, that makes some sense? If you look at the, the Linksys routers, for example, they became hugely popular when they open sourced the hardware. That if you, any of you here remember the WRT54G routers, uh, it started badly, by the way. Somebody had to find out that there was Linux and ask them for the source code, and they said no, and everybody started, went, started going legal on them, and they said, okay, fine, we'll publish the source code. And it was a mess because they published a source code of Broadcom drivers, which was not open source. So Broadcom came into the story and said, you guys are doing something really bad. So they negotiated, they got it done. And now every Linksys router that has Linux-based firmware has the source code published. They have a website called the GPL Download Center. And they're using that. And because of that, they're probably one of the most uh, popular brands in the uh, geek community, so the guys who actually buy their own routers and not use the one that's provided by their DSL provider. So it's a great way to suddenly become extremely attractive uh, to, uh, to, your, uh, to your user population. Um, another one that's interesting is uh, HR benefits. Uh, again, you have some statistics here. I'm just going to give you an example. I, I work with, as a customer of mine, uh, a, a company that is in the tobacco industry. Now. If you look at it this way, who wants to work for a company that's manufacturing poison, right? Uh, so they're having a hard time getting really good people on board. They have three ways of getting really good people on board. Huge salaries. A friend of mine is now working for the United Nations, but he was offered a job there 10 years ago. And even today, he still regrets that salary. It gives you an idea of how good it was back then. They have amazing campuses. So when you go there, it's like ultra-modern stuff with little spaces where you can sit down, food, drinks, free, great working environment. But they're trying to attract a specific population, developers, really good developers. And those guys, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea, salaries are interesting, but working in a way that is really fun and interesting and creative, etc., and makes sense to you guys, it probably trumps everything else. So what are they doing? They're doing open source, and they're talking about it. They're communicating on the fact they're, that they're participating in project X or Y, uh, that they're looking for a specific open source competency to work on their, uh, on their open source infrastructure, and they're turning open source into a recruitment tool. Uh, and, and there are some companies, Deutsche Bank also uh, recently said that they were doing open source because it's a great way for them to, to recruit and retain uh, top talent. So, Combine that with a marketing communication strategy and make sure that as, as a company, when you want to attract the best, give them the best possible working environment. And that includes developing, participating, participating into real cool open source projects. So that's, that's um, another of these, uh, these benefits. 
Okay. Um, ethical and other reasons. So here, I mentioned already a little bit of this, but in particular when you're in an NGO or in a government or if your company has a specifically uh, ethical oriented focus, open source taps into these, this spirit, right? Into the community spirit, into the sharing spirit. So uh, govern governments see this as sharing the knowledge. Uh, I think it was the UK government that said everything that we develop belongs to the state, so belongs to the people, so it should be open source because that's the only way that it can belong to the people and not belong to some uh, stupid commercial uh, corporation. So that's also a, a, a great way. If you're uh, in a startup and you're going to do things that are you know, based on community and sharing, you really want to do that as open source, but we all know that here. Um, but for great and bigger corporations, it actually makes sense to position yourself that way. So that also combines, of course, with a marketing benefit, right? You do things ethically, but if you're not going to communicate about it, you're missing half of the benefits of doing ethical stuff. So combine uh, ethical and, and marketing, and you have some, some really great tools. Finally, um, for, uh, for startups, uh, it can be seen sometimes as a, as a little bit of a challenge convincing a VC to invest in a project where your products are free. Right? Give us $20 million, because we all know the, 20 the first $20 million is the hardest to get. That's the title of an old book. And um, give us $20 million and we'll develop these really, really cool products that we will give away for free to everybody who wants to download them. And VCs tend to not look at that really, really well, because a typical VC is not your average investor. Uh, they're expecting to throw money at you and to get 10x, 100x, 1,000x the investment. So if you tell them that there's no revenue stream from your product, that doesn't work. So when you're doing open source, and that's a team of a completely different subject, but feel free to come and discuss it with me, uh, you want to think about your business model, and you want to make it really clear to your investors why that business model makes sense for them. And some business models make sense for VCs, some business models just make sense for a bank that is looking for a specific risk profile, and, and if that risk profile is met, they will invest. And for some others, you know, you might want to look at ICOs or crowdfunding because there's no real business model and so you need somebody else to put the money in, somebody who's not looking at getting money back uh, from their direct investment. So, so those are a few aspects that you want to take into account when you're looking at um, open source strategy. Why am I doing open source in the long term? Um, and, and how that can uh, be connected into the enterprise strategy. There's things like risk management as well. You know, people uh, want to know that the software they're running is is secure, how do you control the security of open source. I didn't go into the details. There's a really cool study uh, that dates back to 2014, so it's not too old, that shows that the average number of uh, defects per 1,000 line of code uh, in 2014 was 0.76 for commercial software. So 0.76 uh, uh, defects per 1,000 line of code, and it's 0.61 slightly lower, but in the same ballpark from open source. So when you, whenever somebody tells you open source is less secure because all the hackers have access to the code, actually it's more secure because more people fix it really quick. So you end up with less defects uh, per lines of code uh, and, and actually a shorter time to fix. But that's, that's a, it's a very interesting debate between the people who think security by obscurity is better than security uh, in the open. So we have a minute and a half left for questions and hopefully answers. Um, Please feel free to shoot the questions, not bullets. Um, any questions about this uh, approach to open source and kind of the merits of why to use open source? Anybody? Were any of these points completely new to everybody or, or just to some of you or was this like already all known? Uh, thanks for uh, the input. Why do you think not all governments are jumping on open source? Uh, just coming to your example where you said it's injected back into the community of the country. There used to be a study um, of governments that had put in place open source legislation. Um, and that study, and I don't remember, last time I looked at it was a long time ago because I 
it, it seems more or less a given now, but that study tends, tended to say that almost all of the governments had some kind of open source uh, uh, either regulation or recommendations in place, and that those recommendations can go from put a level playing field between open source and proprietary, or open source first. So some governments still don't do that, but most of them have some form of open source friendly or at least open source neutral uh, regulation in place. So the answer is actually most of them do. The majority of them do. That's not sometimes always visible, but even that, like even the U.S. government has that. The Department of Justice, uh, no, sorry, the DOD, Department of Defense, has a whole website that has recommendations on writing software for the government and includes, you should first start with open source. So, pretty good. Okay. Another question up there, further up. So while the microphone goes up, that, that, that's actually something that took some time. Uh, a, year, a bunch of years ago, I went to present uh, Open Solaris to the Chinese government, and I was explaining that it was open source. And the, the, the representatives from the government came to me and said at the end of the presentation, so Mr. Gavi, aren't you afraid that people are going to steal your software? And it's like, no, you can't steal it. It's open source. We're giving it to you. Please use it. Do whatever you want with it. Um, and, uh, and by the way, if you're going to steal it, probably you wouldn't have been the ones to buy it anyway, so we couldn't care less. Uh, and if you're going to use it in production, you probably will want some form of support in the end. So money is going to come back to people who can support it, most likely us. So we're not worried at all, you know. <laughs> but it took some education to get to the point where people understand that using open source isn't stealing open source. Uh, thanks for the talk. You mentioned the example of governments using open source software instead of proprietary software. Um, I remember, I think it was Munich in Germany that used open source for a long time, and I think they just switched back to proprietary. Yep. Um, could you maybe give us a couple of insights in terms of uh, what type of setting or, wh or what type of, uh, of, of setup is, is actually necessary in order to have a nurturing environment for the use of open source software within corporations or even governments? Yeah, so the, the, the first thing, the really important first thing is get prepared. Don't do it like head on. If, if suddenly you say I'm going to replace everything in Microsoft with Linux and LibreOffice, it's going to fail, big time. Uh, the first government who did that was the, the city of Dublin in, in uh, Ireland. And they, they said, we're ditching Microsoft, going to open office and Linux. And a couple of months back afterwards, they went back to Microsoft. It was a huge failure. And they basically did it by themselves and messed up. Um, there are a whole bunch of companies out there that can help you do that. Uh, we're not the guys because we don't do anything with desktop uh, environments in open source. So I can say there's a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, that will go to your setup, look at what you're doing, do a full audit of you know documents, uh, formats, uh, uh, if you're using specific kinds of macros and procedures and s things in documents of, like MS Office, will help you identify what's m migratable, what is not, uh, what's the best way to do this and that, and, and, and follow their recommendations because those people really know how to do it, and if it's only when you do that, that, that job the right way that it's going to work. Once you're there, of course, you want to make sure that, um, that all of the benefits are, are in place. So as a government, for example, you're going to want to com um, communicate, make it visible what you're doing with open source, and you're going to make, want to make visible the benefits you get from open source, right? So if you're, for example, developing open source software, you want to make sure that everybody understands why you're doing that. You want to make sure that your citizens are involved in it. So communicate, put in a portal that says, this is all of the open source software we're developing. Please participate. Uh, the French government has a document that's publicly available, which is uh, a, a reference list of all of the open source software that's being used. So if you want to use, say, a video player, you're going to use VLC. It, it's listed there. So citizens know that if they contribute to VLC, it's contributing to the government. Uh, use and to the benefit of the, the, the general benefit of the state. So visibility, communication, preparation is the best way to do that. Okay. Over. <coughs> Very good answer. So um, any other last questions? We could take one more. Uh, any questions in the back? Perfect. It's a re very relevant topic, so it's, it's good to kind of... Cool. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. 
in a market where it's uh, dominated by uh, proprietary software, Microsoft, Oracle, and this, uh, which uh, sector you recommend to, to, to uh, first adopt open source? Is it education, private sector, government, to start at least? Uh, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Honestly, everywhere that makes sense. Uh, uh, open source can be, if, if it's well done, everywhere. Uh, there are law firms that have been adopting uh, LibreOffice, integrating that into their production environment. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story here. It's a friend of mine has, is a CEO of a company that does uh, audit uh, and quality audits. So the, it's not H SGS, it's a competitor. Um, and they're present uh, all over Europe. They're not global. So I can talk to them about them here. And uh, one summer, they fired an employee who was mi misbehaving. And uh, in, in July, they got a mail from a Microsoft lawyer in France saying, we have a reason to, be, to believe that you're using pirated copies of Microsoft Office all over the place, so you have until September to uh, sort that out. Yeah, oops. So guy came to me and said, can you talk to me about your open office stuff in those days? And so I said, yeah. So he says, is it free? Yeah. Can I use it for anything? Yep, it's open source. How do I go about using it? Well, you download it, you install it, you run it, and there you go. So he said, let me think about it. Then he went to see his IT manager. So they had 1,500 people on board. They had documents with um, um, uh, macros and things like that. So he went to see his IT manager and he said, you have 15 days to move everybody to uh, open office. 15 days, 1,500 employee. And the guy said, let me think. OK, we'll do it. So it took him three weeks. So over the summer, they moved everybody to, uh, to open office. And they, they didn't do an audit, but the guy was reasonably competent anyway. So they left a few PCs with officially licensed versions of Microsoft Office that had the documents that were the most complex to run, things that had integration between spreadsheets and Word and things like that. Everybody else was moved to, uh, to uh, Open Office. There's only one person who complained. It was a secretary who came to the CEO and said, I have an issue with this. Well, open Office, in those days, right? Open Office doesn't look as good as Microsoft Office on my resume. And the guy told her, you know, are you working to make this company run, or are you working to get a good CV? Yeah, yeah you're right. So, and that was it. That, everything else went according to the book. It was perfect, and in September, they sent an email, uh, a, a letter to the lawyer said, this is what we did. We ditched MS Office, we used Open Office. Thank you. That was it. So, um, but, and, and that's, you know, in, in the quality control, but I've seen people use open source in the data center on, in the pharmaceutical world, uh, in the, uh, the, the plane industry, in the, everywhere, basically everywhere. Great. So it's never too, Just uh, do it. too late to start, All right? Just, Just start. do it. Just do it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, and a round of applause for our speaker. Thanks, everybody. Super. So everybody from the back, please uh, do come, come down, come closer, and find your seats.